good afternoon. Um, it's my enormous pleasure to welcome two people who've never been to the festival before, and I hope they've had such a nice time, they'll keep coming. Um, we've never had somebody from Mexico before, so Yuri Herrera, give him a big round of applause. Uh, Yuri is actually a political scientist, and he's a very good writer. And I think we saw him before, yesterday, I think, on a panel here. And today he's going to be uh, chatted to or with, he'll be chatting with, um, Luke Naima, is it Naima? Like N-E-I-M-A, Luke Naima. And Luke is from Granta, the very famous British magazine. He's actually the online editor and also the digital director of uh, Granta. And it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you as well. So give them both a big round of applause. <laughs> They'll be talking and I imagine you'll be reading, Yuri, for about an hour. And then afterwards, um, I just want you to know that the restaurant will still be open, there'll be book signings outside, and um, there's still t-shirts and guides and things for sale. So see you later, and have a wonderful session. Great, so um, Yuri, you're the, Yuri's the author of three um, books that have been translated into English. Um, I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Um, they're called uh, Signs Preceding the End of the World. Transmigration of Bodies and Kingdom Cons. And today we're going to talk mostly, I think, about signs preceding the end of the world and a bit about a new book that you've got coming out. Um, but to start with, uh, Yuri's going to read a short excert from Signs. You want to yeah. do it now? Okay. Yeah, I think that'd be a good well, way to start. Um, I probably should just give a little bit of context. Signs preceding the end of the world is a, a, the story of a voyage. There is this woman called Makina whose mother asked her to go to the other side. It's an unnamed other side to look for her brother that went over there to reclaim a land that he, has, he says has been stolen. So um, after she just has crossed, these are her, her first uh, reflections, on what, mainly on what she's uh, listening. They are homegrown, and they are Anglo, and both things with rabid intensity. With restra restrained fervor, they can be the meekest, and at the same time, the most careless of citizens. I'll be, I'll, I'll be grumbling under their breath. Their gestures and tastes reveal both ancient memory and the wonderment of, an, of a new people. And then they speak. They speak an intermediary tongue that Makina instantly warms to, because it's like her, malleable, erasable, permeable, a hinge pivoting between two, between two like but distant souls, and then two more, and then two more, never exactly the same ones, something that serves as a link. More than the midpoint between homegrown and Anglo, their tongue is a nebulous territory be between what is dying out and what is not yet born, but not a hecatomb. Makina senses in their tongue not a sudden absence, but a shrewd metamorphosis, Meta metamorphosis, a self-defensive shift. They might be talking in perfect Latin tongue and without warning, begin to talk in perfect Anglo tongue and keep it up like that, alternating between a thing that believes itself to be perfect and a thing that believes itself to be perfect, morphing back and forth between two beasts until out of carelessness or clear intent, they suddenly stop switching tongues and start speaking that other one. In it brims nostalgia for the land they left or never knew when they use the words with which they name objects, while actions are alluded to with an Anglo verb conjugated Latin style, pinning on a sonorous tail from back there. Using in one tongue the word for, the, for a thing in the, other, in the other makes the attributes of both resound. If you say, give me fire, when they say, give me a light, what is not to be learned about fire, light, and the act of giving? It's not another way of saying things. These are new things. The world happening anew, Makina realizes, promising other things, signifying other things, producing different objects. 
Who knows if they'll last? Who knows if these names will be adopted by all, she thinks. But there they are, doing their damnedest. That's great, thank you. Um, I, I love in that passage the way you talk about the metamorphosis between one form of language and another where two languages meet. Um, and that's something you articulate quite well uh, in your books, not just between English and Spanish, but between different uh, levels of Spanish. Like you're very, um, you, you spend a lot of time articulating bits of slang and the way uh, you'll have a passage of dialogue, for instance, where someone is, is talking in kind of a, a slang form and then we'll cut to the narration, which will be a very lyrical prose. Can you talk about the ways in which you kind of um, switch between those discourses and what happens when you do that? Yeah, well, what I try to do is not to think about these discourses uh, 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 as discourses like clearly clear cut, uh, uh, separated. You know, yeah. I think if if you if you think about low culture and high culture, you will end up doing just a sort of maniatic culture in, in which you are just repeating uh, uh, other other people's uh, rules. What I think is, my, my, as my heritage, is all the different kinds in which language uh, keeps evolving. And by this, I mean also Cervantes. I keep rereading uh, Don Quixote, for instance, and also all the ways in which uh, people create uh, new words and acronyms in Twitter and also the ways in which politicians destroy the language and also all the ways in which the television pretends or, 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 or TV shows pretend to, um, to capture the, the, the side guys of, of the moment. And what I think is that we don't have to just adjust to any one of those. But what we can do is to take all, all these ingredients to create something else. You know? mm -hmm. And this, this comes to me from two, two main principles when I'm writing. You know? One is that language is always changing. Mm -hmm. That dictionaries are just a point of reference, but it's not, it, 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 yeah. it's not a set of rules that we have to obey. And the other one ha has to do with the fact that literature for me is not supposed to reflect reality. Because the only thing that reflects reality is a mirror. And a mirror is stupid. A mirror doesn't think. Yeah. And literature adds things. Yeah. Literature is, is, is something that, that is not just subservient to reality, but it's doing something else to reality. Yeah. So when I combine these two things, that is what I, what, what I try to do with language and, and, and stories. You know? Yeah, that, that's a, I'm glad you brought up the mirror. Um, there's a line you have in Kingdom Cons, which is the first of the trilogy, I think, that you wrote, if, if that's yes. right. And that's a story of an artist kind of learning to do their art. Um, and, and you talk about uh, this artist figure when he first starts uh, writing songs and you describe the way he's doing it. And you say, um, it was all imitation, a mirror held up to lives overhead. It had all been done before. Mm -hmm. So this image of the mirror is something that you, you're kind of rejecting. <coughs> Yet at the same time, this, this that's a kind of um, touchstone for the realist tradition. Yes. I'm thinking of Stendhal, who, who says the, the work of the novelist is to take a mirror and hold it out to the street. By the river. So you're consciously kind of rejecting that. Is that yes. Yeah. No, well, uh, this is something that I, that, that I really admired for a while. I mm -hmm. remember for, I, I, uh, for a while I, I really admired, I, I still admire them, uh, um, 19th century European novelists, you know, spe especially Flaubert was, was yeah. really important for me. Um, but eventually I understood that even, even when they thought they were reflecting reality, they were doing something else. Yeah. They are choosing parts of reality to, uh, to convey something about themselves, to convey something about, about yeah. the, their, their own desires and anxieties. I remember a while ago, I was in a conversation with another writer in, in, in Huma, a place close to New Orleans, and he was saying for me, what is important when I'm writing is that 
I get all the details right. And he says that he has this journalistic technique to go to a place and take notes about specifically how the, the place is built and how it smells and how it sounds and what, is, what kind of people are, are, are there. And I told him that I, I, I agree that that is very important to get, to get all that data and to get all the information uh, right. But for me, it's even more important to get the nightmares right, yeah. you know, that because it, 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 it's not that important that you describe, um, describe an object being objective. What is important is what this object or what this situation or what this person is doing to your soul and what are you, how you are reacting in the face of, mm -hmm. of a, a certain situation or, 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 a, or a certain character. So when I hear people that describe themselves as realists, what I think is that they are just thinking in a fixed description of reality. But reality is changing all the time with, the, with, the, with what we do towards it, you know? So can you tell us a little bit about the, um, the nightmare in this book? Which one? Science preceding the end of the world. You kind of start with a sinkhole. And it's, it's this idea of migration, but it's also that image of, of the descent into, yeah. into the underworld, which is several mythologies at once. Well, it, it's, it's, it's several things at the same time, or I, I intend it to be, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, the, um, it's, it's the voyage of, the, of this woman in, in a really simple way, is the voyage of this woman and how in this voyage, in this trip, she starts discovering how she's changing, how her language is changing, how the idea of her country and the country where she is going are also changing. But at the same time, in a symbolic way, it could be the last trip of a, of a dead soul. Mm -hmm. what I, one of the uh, things that I took for this book was the structure of the Mexica, what is usually called Aztec structure of the descent to Mictlan. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this yeah. because I can just spend like a whole hour as, uh, yeah. trying to explain it. The thing is this. Among the Mexica, what people know as the Aztecs, there were like at least three places where you would go after you died. One was the Tlalocan, um, which was basically for uh, for little kids and um, and for uh, for people who died at death by water, and that meant drowned, or if your head got swollen with liquids. Um, that was a really nice place where all, all you did was just to have honey all day. Mm -hmm. There was a Ilwika Tonatiu, which was a place where the warriors would go after they, they died, or the women who died in labor, because the women who died in labor were considered that they died in the middle of a battle. And there was the Mictlan, a lot of people call it Mictlan, but it, it, it was the Mictlan, which was a place where you would go if you had what they called the earthly death, which meant, yes, old age, a regular disease, or an accident. And, well, we don't know all the details of this voyage because this, this culture was destroyed, but the few sources that we have that, that more or less agree is that they would have to go through nine underworlds and in each of these underworlds you would get stripped of one of those things that make you human your certain emotions or and your smell and things like that and in the end in the last uh, underworld that had no smell no lights no noises you would just become part of this uh, sort of uh, recyclement of of being, it's not hell. It's it's not it's not uh, it's not heaven. It's it's something else. You just become part of this spiral of of being. So I took that as as the structure of the novel. Each one of the of the chapters um, corresponds to each one of these underworlds. Now I don't think that. The readers need to know this. This is, was just something that helped me to have some direction and to uh, and to give some volume to the to the to the yeah. story. You know, and it, it it serves as a sort of allegory for migration, which is one of the main themes. Um, I was uh, I, I really appreciated this this way you described 
how migration affects people in the book. And uh, I think quite early on, there's a description of what happens when people leave. They go from Mexico to the US, they get a job or whatever, and they come back. And you say something like, they're no longer themselves. It's almost a, a doppelganger figure. And that it's the sense of the horror of migration when that identity is lost. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, th that is one of the one of the many fears that migrants have to, have to face, you know. Uh, when you come back and people don't recognize you, but also that you don't recognize the place that you have been missing. And in that moment, you feel that you are like in this sort of limbo, you know. And that can be... Uh, that can be a tragedy, and that can be a really ominous feeling. On the other hand, and this, this has to do with the title of the novel, mm -hmm. it can be an opportunity for you to create something new, or to understand that neither the place that you left was, is, is static, nor your identity. But both things are constantly changing. So the title, Science Preceding the End of the World, has to do with this feeling that a lot of migrants have when they have to abandon their family, their land, their language, and it's a sort of end of the world, and they, are just, uh, uh, and they just have to reinvent themselves. And this reinvention uh, part of the, of the process was something that was interest, interesting for me when, when I was writing this, that even though it feels like a hecatomb, it's, it can be the other thing. Mm -hmm. it, re, it requires a lot of strength and it, requi it requires a lot of imagination and it requires luck also, yeah. and good fortune. But it is, um, it is possible, that's, that's what I think. That's a, that's a kind of personal story too, isn't it? I mean, you've been in New Orleans now almost a decade, is that right? Uh, no, a, a little bit more than six years, yeah. Okay, about yeah. six years, so not quite that long. But still, as a, a, a Mexican writer writing in Spanish from uh, America, I mean, what does that do to the way that you uh, articulate Mexico? Well, I have lived in 11 cities now. I have lived in two cities in Mexico, then I lived in France, and then I have lived in several cities in the United States. And, well, it, it does a, a lot of things to, to, to your memory, you know. Memory is also something that is always changing, you know. The past is something that is always changing when you start understanding things in a, uh, under a different light. And being in a different country is very literally being under a different light. And your, your language, all the, 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 the language with which you remember things also be, becomes uh, different. Um, things that you thought, that you understood, you start rethinking them. So I'm just gonna give you an example. Now that I live in, in New Orleans, which is a really interesting place within the United States. In a way, New Orleans is uh, it's in the core of American culture mm -hmm. because of its musical uh, production and certain political transformations that happened there. In a different way, it has nothing to do with the rest of the country. It has its own gastronomy. It, it has really interesting uh, migration patterns. For instance, the most important uh, Hispanic migration in New Orleans is not Mexican, but from, uh, from Honduras. So the same way that if you are in Los Angeles or in Texas, and if you are from either Argentina or Honduras or Guatemala or El Salvador, they call you Mexican, in New Orleans, even if you are Mexican, they called you Honduran, you know, and and I and I kind of love that, uh, you know. At least like yeah, I, 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 and now and then people when they say sometimes in a nice way, sometimes in a not so nice way, they say like you Hondurans, and I never correct them and say like mm, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm part of the Honduran co uh, community here, you know, and. Um, the other day, I was listening to the, one of the two uh, radio stations in Spanish that are in New Orleans that are run basically by, by Honduran um, migrants. And they were talking about a concert, a public concert that was going to be in New Orleans with, with very popular musicians, especially from Mexico. And the way they were announcing it, it was 
the biggest musical event in New Orleans history. Which is like a very, very bold a statement, statement. For, for, <laughs> for New Orleans, you know, for the place, where, for the birthplace of, of, of Louis Armstrong and many other people, you know. And it's not that they are ignorant. They know what they are doing. But the thing is this, you have, a, you have this layer of people in New Orleans that are enamored that, with their own identity as a black city, the, the city of, of, of soul, the city of jazz, and they don't <coughs> accept that the city is changing with all these other migrants that, that don't fit yeah. with, with, with the dichotomy and the binarism. And so this, the migrants say, okay, you're not gonna pay attention to us, we're not gonna pay attention to you. Yeah. Even though there is a constant interaction all the time in, term, in, in, in terms of work. Anyway, I, I think I deviated, but, but what, I, what I was trying to say is that this, uh, this moving around a lot makes you rethink your own culture and makes you do something that I insist is something that writers have to do all the time, which is to feel strange, as a strangers before reality and as a strangers before language, so that you have the opportunity to recreate it all over again every time you sit down and, and write, you know? Um, speaking of the uh, power of writing, I, I think this might be a good moment for you to read the second um, excerpt from, from Signs that you've prepared. And this happens after Makina, the main character, is. Yeah, this is, this is further ahead in the book. Yeah. And something, hap something important already happened to her. Um, I'm going to stop pretending that, that I can read like this. Um, hmm. Something important happens to her. And she's walking and she, she sees the following scene. She had already left the barracks when she heard, you too, assume the position, you too. She turned and saw a horribly pasty policeman pointing at her. Are you deaf? Get in line. In a vacant lot pooled with black water were half a dozen men on their knees, staring at the ground. They all, they all were or looked homegrown. Makina took her place beside them. You think you can just come here and put your feet, uh, your feet up without earning it, said the cop. Well, I got news for you. Patriots like me are on the lookout and we are going to teach you some manners. Lesson one, get used to falling in. You want to come here, fall in and ask permission. You want to go to the doctor, fall in and ask permission. You want to say a fucking word to me, fall in and ask permission. Fall in and ask permission. Civilized. That's the way we do things around here. We don't jump fences and we don't dig tunnels. Out of the corner of her eye, Makina could see the cop's tongue poking out as he talked, all pink and pointy. She could see too that even though he didn't draw, he also didn't take his hand off the holster where his gun was. Suddenly, the cop addressed one of the others, the one beside her. What you got there? He took two steps toward him and repeated, What you got there? The man was holding a little book and gripped it tighter when the cop came close. He resisted a bit, but finally let him snatch it away. Ha, huh, said the cop after glancing at it. Poetry. Looky here at the educated worker comes with no money, no papers, but hey, poems. You are romantic, a poet, a writer? Looks like we're going to find out. He ripped out one of the last pages, laid it on the book's cover, pulled the pencil from his shirt and gave it all to the man. Write. The man looked up, bewildered. I told you to write, not look at me, you piece of shit. Keep your eyes on the paper and write why you think you're up the creek. Why you think your ass is in the hands of this patriotic officer? Or don't you know what you did wrong? Sure you do. Right. The man pressed the, pe the pencil to the paper and began to trace a letter, but his trembling prevented him. He dropped the pencil, picked it up, and tried again. 
He couldn't compose a single word, just nervous scribble. Makina suddenly snatched a pencil and book, and, and book away. The cop roared, I didn't tell you to. But he fell silent on seeing that Makina had begun to write with determination. He kept a close watch on her progress, smiling and sardonic the whole time, though he was disconcerted and couldn't hide it. Makina wrote without stopping to think which word was better than which other or how the message was turning out. She wrote ten lines, and when she was done, she placed the pencil on the book and fixed her gaze upon it. The cop waited a few seconds, then said, give me that. Took the sheet of paper and began to read aloud. We are to blame for this destruction. We who don't speak your tongue and don't know how to keep quiet e either. We who didn't come by boat, who dirty up your doorsteps with our, with our dust, who break your, bar your barbed wire. We who came to take your jobs, who dream of wiping your shit, who long to work all hours. We who filled your, your shiny clean streets with the smell of food, who brought you violence you, did, you had never known, who delivered your dope, who deserved to be changed by, by neck and feet. We who are happy to die for you, what else could we do? We, the ones who are waiting for who knows what. We, the dark, the short, the greasy, the shifty, the fat, the anemic. We, the barbarians. The cop had started off in a mock portentous voice, but gradually abandoned the histrionic as he neared the last line, which he read almost in a whisper. After that, he went on staring at the paper as if he'd gotten stuck on the final period. When he finally looked up, his rage or his interest in his captives, ca captives seemed to have dissolved. He crumpled the paper into a ball and tossed it behind him. Then he looked away, turned his back, spoke over the radio to someone, and took off. McKinney stood as soon as, uh, as the cop had gone, but the others took some time to realize they weren't under arrest. They looked at one another, half glad and half mistrustful, then looked at Makina but couldn't say anything to her because she started walking again and all they could make out was her silhouette against the sun. That's lovely. A round of applause. And I, I love that excerpt because it, um, it demonstrates something that you do well, I think, in a lot of your writing, which is to create or show a hierarchy of power and then to subvert it. What gives writing the ability to subvert power? I am not sure. Uh, when, whenever, whenever people speak about political writing in literature and, or ask if your writing is political, I always say that every, every, all writing is political in the sense that every single word that you choose has uh, has meaning in a political in a in a political sphere, and that you are assuming as natural certain hierarchies and certain positions of power, okay. and certain gender gender positions and, and and race relations, and and even though you you are not doing an explicit political discourse about it, you are always part of of some uh, some part of it, and what I think is that. Uh, literature changes the political conscience of certain communities, but it does it usually in a really low way, in a really slow way. You know, uh, literature doesn't attempt to have the, f the effects that have journalism or the, or the, or the mass media. I think literature starts changing the meaning of one word at a time or one expression at a time. We have had a few examples throughout history in which a book can make immediate change, and I'm just thinking of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness that, 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 that created a whole, a whole discussion in, in the British parli yeah. Parliament. But I think that that is, that, that is a, an exception. Mm -hmm. In general, it has to do with um, 
as low circulation of, of books and how people uh, and how certain certain ways of looking at reality start becoming um, a generalized way of understanding reality. And I'm thinking, for instance, in Kafka. Kafka was not read in his time. It took a long time for, uh, for Kafka to become widely read. But the way we understand that, 20th, that the horrors of the, of, the, of the early 20th century have to do with what Kafka told us about it. Mm -hmm. The way we understand modernity, the way we understand the, the horrors of the state and, and, and the horrors of, of, of what an individual could, 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 uh, could be done, you know, all that comes from, from, from Kafka. And so literature requires patience. Mm -hmm. requires patient readers and requ re requires time, you know, that's yeah. what I think. Um, on, on the note of, of patience and time, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your new book, which you're working on, which is finished in Spanish, but waiting for it to be translated into English. Yeah, this is a book that is really important for me. It took me several times, even though it's really, really short. Well, like all my books, but this is based in part of the investigation I did when I was doing my PhD in Berkeley. Um, when I was doing my PhD in literature, I didn't want to do a, a, a dissertation that was just like, uh, to say like the works of Octavio Paz or, some, yeah. or something horrible like that. So uh, I wanted to do something that I really cared about. Um, I started researching a real story that happened in my hometown in Pachuca. In uh, March 10th, 1920, there was a fire in a mine called El Bordo, and um, the owners of the mine, who were American, decided to close it off with a lot of the miners still inside. So basically, they killed them, uh, uh, they, they, they buried alive them. And they opened the mine one week later, and they found that there were seven miners still alive, which means that <laughs> the moment they closed it, there were a lot more still alive. So there was an investigation, but the investigation never looked into the owner's responsibility, mm -hmm. but they just tried to determine the origin of the fire, and they hinted that maybe it was the responsibility of one of the miners. I mean, <laughs> you mean, uh, so the victims. So what I did is I, I took that judicial file, and I treated it as fiction. So I analyzed how this was a legal lie and how it was created. But that, that is a PhD dissertation, and, uh, and, and, well, and I analyzed all the other materials that were around this. What I wanted to do is just to tell the story for the people in my city to have the story and that they could, and that it was not, not lost. So I took all the, the, the sources that I found about it, and I just told it without speculating, without adding anything, just as, uh, uh, as a story that needed to, to be known. And for instance, this the, in the cover in the Spanish edition, this is the picture of the mass grave that was made even before they knew how many corpses they would, they would, they would find. And of course, the owners of the mines, they said that they would uh, erect a monument and they would give the money to the widows and they, they didn't do either of those things. So uh, anyway. Uh, it's an important story to tell and make known. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I asked my publisher that I wanted to be, because my publishers are in Spain, that I wanted there to be a Mexican edition so that it would be widely distributed and that I wanted to be, I wanted there to be um, an electronic edition uh, that was free to download because I, I didn't want to, to, to make any money out of this. So it was a, a really difficult book for me to write because I, I wanted to limit my language to the language that I found in the sources. Okay. But there it is. So you weren't sort of using the tools of of fiction or creative nonfiction to enliven it, or yes, yeah, in in the sense that also, I I I wanted it to be uh, not a, lam a lamentation, but a story that you would start reading it, and then you can stop yeah. until the end. Impulsive. Yes, well, you that's that's what I try to do. You know, it's it starts with uh, with a minor. Uh, that 
that smells the fire and starts calling every, everybody to get out of, uh, of the mine. And there is that, the hours of, compu uh, of confusion and, uh, uh, to determine when to close the mine and when they actually closed it and with how many people inside. Um, and then a description of what happened the next days while the women were waiting outside and they wouldn't let the women get close to the, to the mine and they were desperate and, and, and they were like physically trying to get into, in, yeah. into the mine even though it was on fire because they wanted to rescue their, their loved ones, you know. Yeah. So it's a kind of anonymity. Uh, you're, you're telling us about this disaster, but uh, is it important to also just articulate the emotions of these people as they're going through it? Or well, yeah. But the thing is this: for me, one of the important parts of the of the novel is what has not been told. Yeah. Because I didn't want to do what, for instance, the press of the time did, which which is that they didn't interview the the surviving minors, or they didn't interview the widows, they just assumed what they were feeling. Mm -hmm. And that is another level of violence. And I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I said is, what we don't know is part of this story. Mm -hmm. What we don't know is an object in this, in this story. What we don't know is something that has to be acknowledged, and I don't want to just feel it fill that void with my imagination, you know? Yeah. So um, what I give is, what, what, what I give in, in the text is a description of the other kinds of violence that we know about so that you can, you can, you can imagine what these women would feel when they know that their loved ones are there so the being reader, buried alive, you know? The reader can fill in the gaps. Yes. Because there's a way in which just facts and, and the kind of description of facts can, can be alienating, but, but the same way they can have a kind of cumulative effect in, in the way that Bolaño does in, in, a, in a novel like 2666, where he's describing the violence done to women. And, and, and it's just that the story after story after story sort of um, achieves a different sort of force. Yeah. A uh, thing that is sort of similar to that in this way is that um, the, the authorities interviewed all the widows and the women because they wanted to assert if they were who they were in order to give them an indemnization, some, to give them some money. So they cross-interrogate them and the cross, they cross-examine them in, 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 a, in a really intrusive way. They, they ask them if they are honest women, for instance, they, 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 this kind of thing. And at the same time, they never interrogated the, 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 the owners of the mine, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I transcribe one of the examples of one of these cross-examinations and how you can never hear the actual voices of the, of the women. There's only one moment in which one of them says that, Oh, I didn't come earlier because I was sick with pain, and she, which she, she, she meant emotional pain. You know, yeah. that's one of the few moments in which you can see what they are suffering, and not just the voices of the lawyers bullying them to see if they deserve the money. Yeah. You know? well, I can't wait for that to come out in English. Well, that's the thing. I, I thought it was never gonna go beyond the. the the Mexican public, but my yeah. publisher in, in London, Stefan from Another Stories, read it and he said, oh, I, I want to do it. So uh, Lisa Dillman, my translator, just started working on it and it's coming out next year in England. And, and just quickly, because we don't have too much time, but I, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about working with Lisa Dillman, working in translation, especially with English, which is a language you speak very well, yeah. but is not the language you write in. I mean, what is lost and what is gained and, and that sort of... Well, I am really fortunate to work with Lisa we have a great communication. Yeah. I, um, I never put pressure on my, uh, on my translators. I always assume that they know the language into which they are translator, translating much better than whatever I can do. And I don't even do that with English. With English, it is a language that, that, that I understand, that I can read, that I'm not 100% proficient, but, I, but I, I could say something. What I do is that I'm just available for the translators. Mm -hmm. when, I, when the translators wants, want to know something about the specific meaning or nuance of a word or, uh, or about the, the points of reference in reality, 
that uh, are useful, useful for me when I'm creating a scene or a character, I talk to them. But I am, I am not, uh, how do you say that, a um, um, micromanager. I, I can't, I, I don't try to control it. I just think that translation is a step into the abyss because, yeah. and you just have to embrace it and to have fun with that. Yeah. Well, on that note, I wanted to open it up for any questions from the audience. Does anyone have a, a question for Yuri? Hola. Is it? Okay, thank you. Um, hi, good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for looking at the idea of mixing language. Uh, yo soy de California, y cuando yo era chiquita, um, yo tenía una amiga y cada día su mamá me dio una palabra en español. Hmm. So what I told him is that I grew up in California and when I was little I had a friend whose mom gave me a word in Spanish every day. Hmm. Entonces asistí al colegio para ser maestro bilingüe. Yo quiero saber qué te piensas sobre el idea del uso de Spanglish. Mm -hmm. So my question is, you know, uh, I, I went to college, I majored in Spanish, and I want to know what your thoughts about the use of Spanglish is, since you're looking at the yeah. idea of mixing culture and language. Gracias. Well, well I, uh, I remember an anecdote. I don't know if it's true. I heard it years ago that at some years ago, there, uh, Carlos Santana was giving a press conference in California, and a Hispanic American uh, a Mexican-American girl approached him and said, uh, I'm really nervous, I don't know if I should speak to you in English or if I should speak to you in Spanish because you're Mexican, but you live here and you speak English. And he said, hey, you are American, speak Spanish, you know? <laughs> which, which, which is something that, that, that I to totally agree that it's, it's like, um, the whole fantasy of an official language is just something that is only enforced by a certain institution, but language is always changing. And one of the ways in which in the United States more dramatically is changing is in the mix of Spanish and English. The, the, the problem, and I, I don't know if I should call it a problem, but my reflection on the word Spanglish is that usually it pretends to describe a new set of rules for a new language. And what I'm thinking is that Spanglish cannot be this third language that is just static and, uh, and that it's gonna be replacing the other languages. Because what you have is different kinds of Spanish mixing with different kinds of English. You have the Spanish spoken in Honduras, you have the Spanish spoken by the young people and by the old migrants. And, and really, they, 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 there can be very different registers. Mm -hmm. And it's not the same thing speaking to uh, uh, a snob uh, art critic in New York or, to, or, or sp uh, speaking to someone in the, in the hoods in Chicago. You know, there can be very different uh, variations in, in their English. And when you mix this, when you have all these ways of combining, you have more than this one thing that they call Spanglish. So I agree with Spanglish only, with the use of this word only as far as it describes not a new static language, but this really complex, joyfully chaotic set of mixes, you know, of, 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 of the Spanishes and the Englishes, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Thank you. Yui, good day. Um, I noticed in the text that spoke about your session today, Trump was mentioned, you know? Now, I want to know you as an author with your background, how do you tell a story involving uh, a person who says, uh, we will build a wall and we'll yeah. let Mexico pay for it yeah. with the historical background of Texas, New Mexico, 
a whole set of southern states who actually taken away from Mexico originally back in the day. And we don't hear much about that no more. That is like, that is a, a rite of passage that people have glossed over and accepted as historical fact. So how do you put all of this in a pot and mix it up and call it a book? <laughs> Well, 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 the main question was, uh, uh, how do you write about someone like Trump, and how do you put yeah, the things into a book? About, about Trump? Yeah. No, well, the, the thing is, I, years ago, I wrote a, a piece that has been translated into English, and whenever I have read it in, in certain places uh, in the United States with American audiences, they start laughing, and at the end, they are not laughing, and it's called Aztlán DC. And it's, uh, the first line is, um, uh, how, how to think in Mexican, ask himself the last American president. Because that day they are gonna have the first Mexican president. And the story is how, how Mexicans start like invading uh, spaces in a Gramscian way in the, in, in, in the United States and how when finally a Mexican wins the, the elections, you, he says like, oh, you always were repeating this stupid phrase like, mi casa es tu casa, no? Because it's one of the few things that you, you hear that they, they, which is my house is your house. Well, you know what? It, it was true, you know? And, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> And the thing is, I didn't write this to please Mexicans because I also don't like the Mexican nationalism and I'm against all these kinds of patriotism because also Mexico has been horrible towards Central Americans, you know, as bad as, as Americans toward Mexicans or even worse. So in the end, when the, when the president finally arrives and takes a look at his new office at the Oval Office, and he says only one sentence. He says, we are going to have to change these rapes, but he says it in, Fr in French. Uh, because I, I wanted the Mexican president to not speak Spanish, just, yeah. just to also mess with the Mexican audiences. <laughs> and, but the thing is, I, I wrote this years, years ago, and I was playing with what later became reality, which is all the paranoia in a lot of in a lot of the American population of, about all these dirty Mexicans that are coming and take and take our country. And whenever people t are disagreeing with me or are angry about these things, I said like, well, then you have to think about your addictions because you are addicted to cheap labor, but then you don't, you don't want the labor mm -hmm. and you're addicted to drugs, but then you, you but, but then you create all these wars. So assume, what you are addicted to. And then we can talk about, about some new rules, you know? And anyway, there's, we can talk a lot about all the horrors happening with Trump that actually started with Obama, but, but uh, how Trump is just really outspoken and cynical about it. Hi, I have a question in conjunction to his. How do you feel, do you see that these prevalent matters regarding Trump and Mexicans, do they affect your writing at present? Well, uh, the thing is, uh, um, I wrote a piece a uh, few months ago for a uh, magazine in, in, in Mexico. It was also translated into English. It, it's called Beyond the White Noise. And it was, I took this example, I was reading a piece in the New York Times about a guy, a liberal guy, who hated Trump so much that he decided that he was not going to read any kind of news. So he went to his house, a really beautiful house, and, and he blocked every news site and told all his relatives and his, uh, and his friends, don't you ever talk to me about Trump. And he says, like, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm living. I, I, I don't have all these horrible things in my mind. And I was saying is, you know what, there's millions of people that don't have that privilege of not knowing what is going on, you know. So, uh, yes, of course, I am aware all the time, first of all, of my privileges, 
that I can I work in a university where I can say whatever uh, whatever I want and that I can publish and I I can I can I can say Trump is a Nazi in public and that I can say that uh, th that th all these guys in the border they are not patriots they are just cowards they are persecuting uh, women and children that are looking for uh, for jobs but there's millions of people that are suffering that without speaking out so I just have to take that into account when I am writing that it's an immense privilege that I can say that there or that I can say it here and that uh, also somehow this will change the way in which we use certain words you know how we talk about democracy how we talk about law how we talk about uh, human rights. Whenever we use these words, we have to remember that the American state is kidnapping children at the border. You know, mm -hmm. so we cannot use those words again in, in just the way we were using them before. A question over over there in the back. Thank you very much. Everything you've said has been really uh, enlightening. Uh, my question, I guess I have a personal interest because I'm a native English speaker. I'm an American. I understand Spanish, but I speak better Portuguese. Long story. So I'm just curious about what made you decide to write pretty much in Spanish and not try to write in English as well, because it seems like you're very good at speaking in English. So I was just wondering if you had any comments about that, trying to write in a non-native language. Well, I, I, I worked for the first time outside my country when I was 30, you know? So, so Spanish is my, is my na native language. And I go constantly back to Mexico as, as, as much as I can. And I can read uh, English and I can write emails and I have tried to write a lot of things in English, but what I'm missing is all the nuances and I am missing all that depth that it gives you to learn a language from when you were a kid and to understand the evolution of, 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 of certain words. And I don't have a, a linguistic memory of English, you know? So there are some geniuses that can do that, like Nabokov, that he would just learn a language and, and write a, a masterpiece in that language. Uh, I am, yeah, <laughs> of Joseph Conrad, you know, but I, I am not like that. I think I can write some nice puns and some nice tweets in English, but that, that, that's, that's it, <laughs> you know. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question, if anyone has, has anything to ask. Okay, if not, um, well, just thank you, Yuri, for, for a wonderful conversation. It was really fascinating. Thank you, Luke, and thank you all for being here.